can see if this works. <laughs> oh, it's starting. It's starting. Yes. Awesome. Okay, we're live. I'll wait for some of you guys to pop through the chats. So we've had an awesome stream over at Print That Things channel with J Wall. We had like Sparky, CJ. Oh, it was good. It was fun. And it's saying the health is good. Excellent. Cool, so this is going to be recorded, so I'm going to start talking before people have jumped in. Yes, welcome back, Sparky. <laughs> um, so I'm going to say this because it's going to be recorded, but um, today is basically just a really casual Q&A because I just got back from Sydney and I'm still a little bit ill. I don't really have anything planned. Yes, welcome to this. Welcome to the stream, CJ. Um, and I want to go through a few of the Kickstarter things that have been happening and just basically answer your questions because we want to have fun. And I'm going to ask, do any of you guys watch Linus Tech Tips? Um, like the WAN show, you know, this, this hoodie. Oh, I mean, we could, CJ, I just don't know how I'd patch you in because I'm using, um, I'm using o the open broadcast software and I've just got it to work. Uh... So I don't think you'll be able to hear it. Um, not this time, but let's work it out after this or tomorrow if you're around. But yeah, um, they, their WAN show yesterday got DDoSed. So I was trying to watch it at the airport and I was like cutting out. It turns out they were under attack and their, their forum went down and everything. So this is in, in commemoration for hashtag off Linus yesterday because they got DDoSed, which is pretty funny. <laughs> um, but... Uh, yeah, if I can just um, flick through, see if this works. Hey, there we go. So you should now be able to see my screen. And basically, first things first, Trinus is finished. Um, I got my Trinus there, uh, brought it back and assembled it. Took me about 20 minutes from the, to get it assembled the second time, so really easy. They ended up getting 1,006, sorry, $1,600,000 on Kickstarter. So that's pretty pretty awesome and it finished at six o'clock this morning my time or something like that so yeah i mean well done to the trinus team that is absolutely crazy when you have audio in your left speaker no you're not broken um that is me sorry uh da, da, da. properties there's always something there's always something that's wrong Here we go. Okay. How's that now? It should now be mixed into mono. But um, <laughs> hopefully it's okay. Uh, yes. Yes, it's 12.30 on Sunday. So I am from the future, CJ. You are, you are behind. <laughs> um, uh, so yes, cool. So there's Trinus and I thought I would mention the Olo campaign because these guys... So... Interesting fact, I got uh, in touch with one of my followers and apparently they told him that or they were sending me a sample or something, which is completely not true. Um, and that campaign finished about a week ago. And you can see here uh, the, in the updates, they updated it April 21st. Thank you for your support. And they've just gone completely silent. So, you know... Basically, all of these guys in the comments are just, um, you know, wondering what's going on. No updates. Where's the creator? <laughs> uh, and yeah, that's that's a bit of a worrying sign, in my opinion. I did think it was a bit dodgy, but we'll see if they end up updating it. It does take a while for campaigns to get their money back through the Kickstarter, through PayPal and all the collections. It does take a while to filter down, but if they've gone completely silent, um, that's a bit worrying. And I really, really wanted to re remind people and name and shame these guys. This is the Buccaneer 3D printer. So this is a bit disgusting and I really just want to bring this out again. 
This was like three years ago on Kickstarter. And it was a massive thing. People were asking me about it. They pledged $1.4 million towards this, this, this printer. $300 printer at the time was the cheapest you could get. About 60% of the backers haven't gotten their printer yet. And this is three years on. And the thing that's really disgusting is you can buy a Buccaneer now as a commercial unit from the company, yet they haven't finished delivering to backers. And their whole reasoning behind it is like, oh, we need to manufacture a printer that's cheaper so we can fulfill the goals and fulfill your, your pledges. And like, it's just so condescending, this, this, this update. And this was October 15, 2015. So they've just gone, just like, thank you for your money, but goodbye. And that is just wrong. So uh, I, I hope that Olo doesn't do what the Buccaneer Pirate 3D did. But I just want to bring it to people's attention that this has happened before. And I hope it doesn't happen again. Uh, one last thing in the news, as you would have all heard, is MakerBot. Um, so, MakerBot announced that they are taking all the manufacturing offshore. Before, MakerBots were assembled in the States, but the parts were made in China. Now, they're just doing everything in China, and they've shut down, or they're going to shut down, their entire manufacturing setup um, in, in America. And... This is the third time they've laid off people. They did two rounds where they laid off employees. Now they're just laying off their entire manufacturing staff. And it's really the nail in the coffin for MakerBot, in my opinion. I don't see them recovering from this. There was other companies like the Solidoodle Press, which uh, basically Solidoodle tried to do the same thing, move manufacturing to China to make, make it cheaper. And that killed the company because of quality control issues. And... We already know that MakerBot's already had a few quality control issues. So, yeah, I'm not looking... No, it's not going to look very well for them. And <laughs> it's uh, a lot of people are saying, you know, is 3D printing dead because of this? Like, not really. It's just one company. But MakerBot may well be dead by the end of this year. Apparently, they are selling an average of something like six printers worldwide per day towards the end of last year. Like, the, the figures are just dismal. Like, so terrible. Um, yeah, and that's right. Yeah, CJ. So basically, they've dropped the price for the Replicator Two down to to seven ninety nine. I didn't even know the Replicator Two was still being sold. I mean, that's an ancient machine. That is so outdated. It's laughable, and they're apparently still selling them, which is just pathetic. So they've they've like you know dropped the price by more than half, and I I like I don't see them recovering from this. Uh, no, Inkjoid, you have not missed anything. I'm pretty much just rattling on about some Kickstarter and new stuff. So let's just uh, go back to my face. There we go. Excellent. And yeah, so that's uh, some new stuff. And I also wanted to just go through some Q&As that I got, uh, got sent through during the week. Um, one which is interesting is from Z, who sent it through on my Patreon. And he asked... I want to ask a very basic question. Why is there a need for bed leveling? So let's say on the Wanhal Duplicator i3 V2, and a lot of you guys have these machines. Um, let's say I wanted to replace the springs with standoffs, and the bed shouldn't the bed stay level all the time? Am I missing something important? Probably uh, <laughs> it was one of those shower thoughts. And that's a, really good, that's a really good question, actually. So on machines like the Fabricator Mini, there is no bed leveling. On machines like the Trinus and the Up Mini, there is no bed leveling. And these machines t mostly work fine. But I think the issue with these larger machines is that because they're bigger and they're not as robust, the, the bed leveling is kind of to make up for the fact that they're not completely reliably stiff and, and dimensionally stable. So with the, the, yeah, with the, the Wanhao i3 bed, the springs are a bit dodgy. But that bed, if you move the printer, is likely to become out of level again. And that's, it's their method of calibrating it. Yes, once you have it calibrated, you probably could put standoffs in and probably not worry too much. But each machine is going to be completely different to the other one just because of how it's manufactured and a design and how you do up certain screws and things like that. So it is an interesting question. And yeah, most machines, if they're made well, shouldn't actually need any kind of spring-loaded bed calibration. But... In, in these cases, if they're made cheaply, then they do. Uh, so that's that one. 
But anyway, I think I'm just pretty much going to go through some QAs with guys, just hang out a bit. I'm back in Sydney, as I said, and pretty keen to get stuck into some videos because I haven't been doing many videos because I've been ill and out of Sydney. So I'm going to go through your questions. Oh, hey, Ryan, how's it going? Cool, so we've got 3D print everything. We've got Ryan, so we've got Sparky. Ridgie bot. So Calvin's asking, do you think you'll discuss the Ridgie bot today? Um, don't want to miss it. I'm not really going to talk about the Ridgie bot today because I did some testing before I went away and I haven't touched it since, but there will be a review of the Ridgie bot coming probably end of next week, I'd say. I still need to do a few more tests and some big prints on it, but it's looking really good. I'm really happy with the Ridgie bot so far. The Ridgie bot 2, to clarify, the new version of the Ridgie bot. Yep, Jacob, what would be a good first 3D printer under a thousand for a serious buyer? Uh, okay, I get asked these, what is the best printer for a certain budget all the time? And I really try not to answer these questions. It depends on what you want to print, so what material, how big you want to print, and if you're willing to tinker with the printer, so you want to print it as a hobby, or you want to print it as a tool that just prints reliably all the time. So if you want to print it as a tool, obviously it's going to be more expensive for the build volume you get. But if you want a printer as a hobby, you could get a kit and assemble it yourself and save some money. So I'll just touch on the RigiBot. RigiBot is a great printer under a thousand bucks for a large print volume that can do big ABS, sorry, big PLA prints. It'll do ABS, but not very large because it's open. If you want to do very strong ABS prints, you might want to go with something like the, um, the Robox, for example, but that's over a thousand bucks. The Up Mini is just under a thousand bucks. And that's a small print volume, but it's good at ABS printing. So again, it really depends on what you want. And I've got a really excited announcement coming up very soon. I can't talk about it today, but it's going to be all about helping answer that question because I get asked it all the time. Okay. Any, so the Ink Droid's asking, any plans to come down to Melbourne for the Technology and Gadget Expo coming up? Uh, that's... Possibly the first I've heard of it. There's a few expos I've been invited to. I am going to National Manufacturing Week in Sydney. I'm also planning to go to the New York Makers Fair, which is in October. And I would love to go to CES next year in Las Vegas. But um, in terms of traveling, I've been traveling a lot. And I really just need to knuckle down and get the business side of this, this, sort of this channel sorted out. Because every time I travel, I, um, I lose like a week or two of uh, content, which is why I haven't had much stuff. So, yeah, I would definitely look into it. Um, if I can get sponsored to go there, that would be awesome. But if I have to pay for the flights, I might not be able to make it. Um, I'm saying Rigibot because saying Rigidbot is annoying. And I'm Australian, so we shorten everything. Which is also, just, just on a side note, why I tend to say something is certain mils instead of millimeters. I know it annoys everyone, but in Australia, colloquially... If you're measuring something, a lot of people just say mils because it's, a, it's hard to say millimeters. And I know that's confusing for people using the imperial system, but in Australia we use metric and literally every engineer I know tends to shorten to mils. So I'm sorry if that comes across as confusing sometimes, but we just shorten everything. <laughs> I just need a sip of water. I also don't have my minion today, unfortunately. She's currently back in Perth and my other minion is currently elsewhere. So <laughs> I'm doing all of this just reading your comments, so sorry if I'm, if I'm a bit slow. I'll try to make sure I cover them all. Um, sorry, CJ, I did not see your question. If you want to send it to me again, that would be awesome. I'm, as I said, I don't have a minion to help me. Uh, thoughts on the Trinus? Uh, so, Technology Nerd, uh, any further thoughts on the Trinus? Not really. It's a good little machine. As I said earlier, I, I rebuilt it in about 20 minutes after bringing it back to Sydney. So it's a good machine. The campaign has ended now. They got $1.6 million in funding and they're a great team from what I can follow. So I really think they're going to do some good stuff. Uh, I haven't tested, obviously, the laser capabilities or anything else. And my machine did have the homing issue. But apart from that, it is rock solid. And they actually sent me some spare, uh, some spare guides. So I may well be able to use those for future projects, which should be good. Was that your question, CJ? Which is better, MakerBot or a burning trash can? <laughs> um, look, to be fair, I have seen one or two working 5th-gen MakerBots. 
but for everyone I've seen, I've seen about 10 that just are broken. So the company really, really didn't fare well in that rollout of, of printers. And I, I hate to rag on them so much, but my experience with them was just shocking. I mean, it's a bit like Joel's experience with the FlashForge Finder. Our MakerBot 5th Gen never worked. Its head would be too low. I'd have to put a piece of paper under the automatic nozzle detection to offset it and then pull it out just before it started printing. The bed's not heated. In Australia, this machine's like $5,000. It's just everything is just bad about it compared to other machines you can get. So the 2X was a good machine for its time. MakerBot did not keep up with the times. And I think, as I said, with this new merge to move to manufacture in China, I think they're they're going to, yeah, they're going to die off pretty quick. I think they're, they're not even close to the value that Stratus has paid for them now. They are nowhere near the $400 million that Stratus has paid. <laughs> and print that thing saying that, and he has one. So poor Jaywall has a fifth gen maker bot and he's agreeing with me. That's how bad they are. <laughs> right, going back to the chat a little bit. What do you think? Uh, do you think it'd be possible to combine a similar system to the Trinus aluminum steel with a belt style system for a reliable yes, yet fast print. Yes and no. The design of the Trinus isn't really set up well for taking a belt system. It's just the way they've designed it has to use lead screws. But there's nothing stopping that kind of shape to be using belts. I mean, the, the Up Plus 2, the Up Plus 2 is a very similar shape. It's not modular, but it does use belts instead of lead screws and that machine works fine. It even uses a belt for the Z axis, the Z axis, which works fine. Obviously when you turn it off, it just drops, it doesn't stay in place, but yeah, it can, it can be done. I don't think the China system could be transferred across though. It's just, it's too tightly designed to use lead screws and it works well using them. But obviously, as you saw in my review, you can't print too fast. <laughs> are we friends? Oh, Ryan. Yes, we are. I'm friends with all of you 3D printing guys. I love, <laughs> love doing this sort of thing. Uh, I've been, so Adrian's asking, hello Angus, seen you covering a lot of Kickstarter content about some of the 3D printers being funded. Any thoughts on the Tico? Yes, yes. And Ryan can probably fill you in in the chat about his Tico, which he hasn't got yet because they're not delivering it yet. Um, so I really, I really hope they don't fall into this trap of feature creep where you change something and then you have to spend more time in development and manufacturing to get it right. But the Tico is delayed. Um, and I, I hope that it does get shipped. But from what I saw, you know, you know, last, you know, last few days, it's, it's still going to be a while yet. Oh, Dylan, mate, I am level six. I am rank 60 on chivalry now. So yeah, you and me, let's go. <laughs> You've been playing tons of, oh, what is what's that game? Rocket League. I'm pretty tempted by Rocket League. But, um, sorry, just going on a tangent with Dylan there. <laughs> yes, you did, CJ. Yeah, I mean, the Tico looks really good. Uh, it wowed a lot of people, but again, so did the Olo and so did the Pirate 3D Buccaneer. So, I am really worried they're not going to deliver anytime soon. Um, yeah, there's another project, which is the Bevel. So, Matter... Matter and Form is, this, is the company. They made the Matter and Form scanner I reviewed quite a while ago. It's quite a, a low-cost laser-based scanner. And they made the, the Bevel, which is a, a small laser-based scanner you can put onto your iPhone or your, your mobile device to scan stuff. And that's really delayed as well now. But I only pledged about 70 bucks for that. So I will review that as soon as I get it. But till then, it's delayed. And this tends to happen with a lot of Kickstarter um, hardware projects. A lot of people don't know but Kickstarter was originally started to fund gigs. So if you're a band, you'd go onto Kickstarter and the whole idea was that, you know, your crowd, your your public wanted to see you perform. So they'd, they'd fund a gig and then you'd do the gig and people would turn up. It's pretty easy to set up a gig. It's pretty hard to crowdfund an entire hardware product. So that's where the platform kind of moved to and it wasn't really intended for it, in my opinion. Cool, let's see what else we got. What So, Crafted102 is asking, what hot air gun would you recommend? Anything. I would buy the cheapest hot air gun you can find. 
uh, a place to look depending on where you are. I'm in Australia, so Bunnings have them. They're not very not very uh, cheap, but they do have them. If you're in the States, I'm sure some of you guys can recommend a recommend a, a good hardware store to get a cheap one. Oh, thank you so much, man, for the donation. <laughs> so, jat.mn is saying, today's stream is better. Yeah, I'm back in Sydney, so I've got the proper computer doing encoding, which is good. Um, he's saying, you should do a mini project with all parts only printed on the Fabricator Mini. That would be pretty cool. Uh, the Fabricator Mini is a capable little machine in printing in PLA, and as you'll see on Chuck's channel, printing in ABS. So, yeah, actually a little project using it would be pretty cool. i do not quite sure what it would be. I mean, it's just too small to print anything like an Arduino case. But in terms of printing small gears and things, it's definitely capable of that. Yes, um, that would be my parents in my garden walking past my window if you just saw that. All right, going to go back. Uh, sorry if I missed your questions again. As if you missed it, I don't have my minion, so I'm just going through myself. Uh, so, Daniel is asking, E3D clone or real one? Hmm, so my opinion on this may be something a lot of you may disagree with. I tend to want 3D printing to be more accessible. And if you can afford a clone, but you can't afford a genuine E3D, I would say get the clone. And that may upset people because, yes, they're clones, they're cutting away at E3D's profits. But on the same token, if you do have the money to spend, definitely get the genuine one. They are better, no question about it. But if you can't afford it and you want to get into 3D printing, Get what you can afford, and if that's a clone, then so be it. Oh, and the Polymaker Polisher. Yeah, I'm definitely going to do a video on that. So, it's interesting, the Chinas guys, uh, they're, they're partnered up with Polymaker, so they've got like a special crossover promotion. But the Polisher looks really interesting. For those who haven't seen it, I'll just quickly run you through it. It's, it's a vapor smoothing polishing kit for smoothing your prints, but it's not like using acetone and ABS. It's using ethanol, so alcohol, and a special plastic which is melted by alcohol. And it uses a sort of uh, diffuser, I don't know the right term is for it. It doesn't actually heat it up, it just sort of spits out tiny micro, micro droplets. And it looks really cool, it definitely looks cool. I tried to do a bit of research to find out what plastic they would be using, and I'm going to do a bit more research before making my video. It's a bit hard to know what it would be. But um, it's definitely something that's affected by alcohol, which is a fairly, fairly safe uh, solvent. I mean, you drink it, so it's fairly safe compared to something like acetone. It's not as volatile. But in saying that, I'm not sure how long-term the plastic part's going to be. So still a lot of unknowns. I probably will back it, though, or, or something like that, because it looks really cool. It's, it's a safer way to smooth parts. Using a rice cooker, yes, I've done it in a video, and I do it all the time. Using a rice cooker to smooth ABS parts with acetone is kind of dangerous and it's not something you'd want to do on your desk. PVB, okay. So it's polyvinyl something. Um, that'd be interesting. I wouldn't want to print with anything like a PVC. That'd be polyvinyl chloride. So yeah, cool. Okay, thanks for that duplicate. I'll definitely check it out. That is pretty cool. I appreciate it. Uh, so 3D Print Everything is asking, what's your favorite 3D printing company right now and favorite filament? Uh, so it's pretty hard to say. I don't really have a favorite. I tend to pick the best out of each one. So like, I, you know, I like the Chinas guys because I've been working with them closely recently. But again, I like the ups, so the tier time, tier time guys. They, they produce really good printers for printing in ABS. But their printers only print really well using their brand of plastic unless you hack them, which I don't really like. Uh, I like eSun brand PLA. I mean, I never even talked to eSun directly, but I use their PLA all the time because it's cheap. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't really have a favorite as such. And I, it would be unfair to do favoritism. I mean, I've been approached by a few companies to do like a, to sponsor this channel exclusively. And I would never do that because I want this to be remain unbiased. And there's no way I would choose a single company to favoritize, I suppose, because that's just not fair. And that's not what it's about. Uh, Inkdroid is asking, did I ever finish my Fallout Buzzsaw build? No. Um, really, really sucks to say, but I had to throw it away because what happened towards the end of last year, I had to move pretty quickly and it was it got caught up in that move. I spent ages finishing it. If, if no one saw it, it was a 
It was a, a weapon from Fallout, um, Fallout 3 from the Pit DLC. And it looked really cool. I was going to finish it, but I had to move. It was big and bulky. I couldn't take it with me and I had to chuck it out, which sucked. So I am definitely going to be doing some more Fallout stuff. I'm looking to make a huge version of the new Super Sledge from Fallout 4 for the upcoming Supernova convention in Sydney, which is going to be awesome. But that one I had to get rid of. So unfortunately, there will be no part two to that video, sadly. I know it was, I wanted to make it like electric and everything. So it spun. Oh uh, yeah, it was, it was tough moving across. I mean, Perth is 4,000 kilometers away from Sydney and I had to move everything across. So anything that wasn't like valuable had to go. So, unfortunately, a <laughs> fat man would be cool. I mean, I did the, I did the fat man pot plant, which I gave away as well. I gave away my fat man mini nuke pot plant. <laughs> Alrighty. So, so Ryan's asking, technology nerd, do you have any more 3D printers you're thinking about reviewing? Yes, I do. So I will be reviewing the RigidBot 2 soon and I will be re-reviewing the Robox, the CEL Robox, because they've come a long way in terms of reliability. Uh, I will be looking more into the Trinus once I get the new motherboard for it to make it work. I am looking at reviewing the Z-Morph or Z-Morph, which is a multi-tool head very expensive and interesting looking printer, but that's going to be a loner and I'm not sure when I'm going to get hold of that. And I am going to be renewing, re reviewing the uh, Up Mini 2 soon, quite soon. So you'll, you can look forward to that. Oh, <laughs> this is fun. <laughs> Do not buy an M3D printer. Look, guys, I actually got in touch with, with Micro uh, M3D and asked, you know, hey guys, your printer's often asked if it's, you know, if it's any good. I get asked on my channel all the time, would you be interested in, in sending me a review unit or some kind? And they were like, oh, we don't have uh, the, the capabilities to send review units, but we can give you a $50 gift voucher towards it. And here's all our marketing stuff to use in your video. I was like, hmm, yeah, no, I'm not spending... I wouldn't even spend $50 on the M3D, unfortunately. Uh, I cannot talk more about the App Mini 2 yet, um, but soon, definitely very soon. Uh, I'm not sure yet. Um, yeah, I, 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 at the moment, they're still be in pre-production, so I'm not sure when they're going to actually release the App Mini 2 to the general public, but once they do, I'll be able to do my review. Cool. Uh, just scrolling back in the comments, Palmer asked, do I miss learning SolidWorks? It was actually a lot of fun. So I learned SolidWorks in university, spent four years at UTS um, learning industrial design and SolidWorks from first year on to fourth year was part of that. And yeah, I actually really enjoyed my SolidWorks classes. I mean, we, we did like a trophy for the first year and I remember doing my entire trophy using 3D sketch planes, uh, sorry, 3D sketches those who don't know, that's not how you usually want to do sketches in SolidWorks. But <laughs> from there, I learned how to use assemblies. SolidWorks is kind of, it's so old and each year they try to add stuff to it that it's kind of a behemoth of a CAD program now. So in terms of doing simple modeling, it's kind of really too complicated. It's a little bit like Mastercam for those who have done CAM work. Mastercam is ridiculously powerful but to learn it it's really difficult with SolidWorks it's kind of the same it's become so powerful there's tools for everything there's tools for threads and bores and all sorts of crazy things but if you just want to model stuff you don't need it you just need something like 123D design or even Tinkercad suits a lot of people but uh, in terms of SolidWorks I still use it all the time uh, when I get a chance you know when I'm working for the 3D printing studio we, I, I used it on a daily basis and I can pretty much use it in my sleep now. I just just can just whack stuff together in it. And it's hard to do that with any bit of software. So <laughs> I'm going to I'm gonna find it hard ever moving beyond SolidWorks, I think, for hardcore proper modeling with, with assemblies and that sort of thing. I am definitely going to... I actually have Fusion 360 downloaded and I was going to play with it before I went on holidays or went away to Queensland. So I'm definitely going to check it out. I know everyone's recommend, recommending Fusion 360, so... 
I, I used the original alpha version, but it's changed a lot since then. So I'm going to see how, how it is. Cool. Um, <laughs> Jia's asking about SketchUp. Uh, I'm going to be the one to say it. Don't use SketchUp for 3D printing. And the reason I'm saying that is it's really hard to get a good STL model out of it, which is not full of errors. And it used to be the only option. Like four years ago, SketchUp was the one to use. But now it's not. Now there's so many better bits of software available for 3D printing as an end goal. So... I mean, SketchUp's amazing for architects and interior design and, and you know, uh, interior designers, things like that. It's really easy to use, but I just find it not very good for exporting good STLs unless you really pay attention to where your faces are and where your your plane your surfaces are lining up. Uh, so Theme Park Attractions is asking, what do I think about Autodesk as a whole? I think they're on the right track. So as a company, Autodesk are really embracing this 3D printer and maker movement. And they're making stuff like Mesh Mixer available for free. I mean, they fund Mesh Mixer. You know, they, they, they saved Tinkercad from the brink of oblivion. Tinkercad was actually slated to be canned. Uh, the company was going to use their servers for some sort of other use. And they were going to shut down Tinkercad back in 2014. So uh, Autodesk stepped in and said, hey guys, you, you're onto something here. How about we just take it off your hands and we'll, we'll pay for it to, for more development? So Autodesk saved Tinkercad and they possibly saved Mesh Mixer or allowed Mesh Mixer to keep developing. So yeah, they're, they're definitely going, doing good things. Clearly, there's some sort of financial reason behind it. They want to get people into the Autodesk ecosystem, but I'm totally okay with that if they're making these tools available for hobbyists for free. Yeah, Tinkercad was going to die. It was, it was literally, I was teaching it to year seven kids. So I'd spent a term teaching it to 14 year olds. And then I suddenly got an email one day saying, oh, okay, we're shutting down in, in a month and you can't make a new account. And that was horrible. But yeah, they saved it, luckily. Cool stuff. Uh, so... Technology nerds asking Indiegogo, Indiegogo or Kickstarter. Just going back on the whole crowdfunding thing because it is a very hot topic at the moment. I, I'm going to be very, <laughs> very blunt. Kickstarter is where you get the projects that are legit and Indiegogo is where you get the, kicks, the projects that are scams. That's basically how it works. So if, you want, if you're anyone who is anyone and want a project to succeed, you go on Kickstarter if Kickstarter does not think your project is legit, they will get rid of you. And a good example of that is the SCARP Laser Razor, which got kicked off Kickstarter because they didn't, they couldn't prove that it was a functional product, functional prototype. And then they went straight onto Indiegogo, and Indiegogo opened, took them in with open arms to do that campaign. That's not a hundred percent true. I know Indiegogo is open to more countries than Kickstarter, but that's kind of how it is. And also, if you see a uh, a, um, if you see a campaign with flexible funding on Indiegogo, avoid it. Avoid it like the plague. That is 100% a complete scam or it giving them the benefit of the doubt, it's someone who doesn't know what they're doing. So flexible, flexible funding on a crowdfunding campaign is just ridiculous to me. And I personally would never back anything on Indiegogo. Um, I know there has been some good projects on there, definitely, I'm not going to lie saying there's always exceptions to the rule, but generally Indiegogo is where the, the scam projects hang out. <laughs> cool. What do you think about eSun Pink PLA? I think eSun Pink PLA is awesome. I still have some left and I use it all the time. It's, I, I, I don't know. I think pink, pink filaments are quite fun and you can get some good prints off it and not many companies have a good pink or it's usually like a sort of light red or usually I don't have a pink at all. So I like the eSun pink. I think it's quite nice. <laughs> uh, Jonathan, I'm going to answer your question now. I don't know anything about the Ray's 3D printers, unfortunately. Um, I have never heard of them before. Yeah, pink is pretty hard to find. It's hard to find a good pink. And again, for you guys just jumping in, I don't have a minion, so I am going through your comments myself. 
<laughs> so I can try to answer them. Da, 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 da. What else have we got? Uh, so Crafted's asking if I built my own 3D printer, what is? So I have gone through many, I guess, thought experiments in terms of building a printer. I've never com fully committed, but if I was to make my own, and usually what stops me is it gets very expensive, but I would use ball screws. And basically, if you think, if you look at the Trinus, it uses lead screws. So these are like Acme threaded screws with a, uh, a, a nut that provides friction along it. A ball screw uses ball bearings to remove friction and they are extremely efficient, extremely accurate, and they are the thing to use for CNC machinery. So if I was to make my own 3D printer, um, I would make it out of ball screws for the, the movements. I would probably use, uh, what are they called? Igis. So I just produce a so ceramic coated Teflon sleeve bearing, or they call them guide rails. These have no ball bearing contact points. They are food safe and they are really accurate. I would use those for the slides and I would probably want to use servos for the, the actual movement, not steppers. And I'd use a servo board because then you can get much faster speeds. But again, as I said, my price list on that would be probably $10,000. So I haven't done it, but if I was to make one myself, I would do that. <laughs> cool. Uh, yeah, no, you can get small ball screws. Um, there's a company in Australia on eBay called CNC and Cupcake World, and they sell CNC parts and cupcake things. Nothing to do with the MakerBot cupcake, they just sell cupcake stuff. But they sell some pretty small ball screws um, and fast ones as well. So like, um, I think 10 mil per turn, 10 millimeters per turn, which is pretty fast for a ball screw. Uh, and yeah, in terms of where I get my eSun, I get it locally from Hobby King. So they used to sell only eSun. Now they're selling Kaleido as well. I haven't tried Kaleido filament myself, but um, I used to pretty much buy out the Hobby King stock of filaments when they stocked eSun which annoyed a lot of people. So they do still have some and it's usually pretty cheap. It's under $20 a kilo Australian, which is nuts for filament. <laughs> all right, guys, I, <laughs> um, I can't answer all your questions and yeah, please be a little bit more polite in the comments. I mean, they're only, he's only 14, but Sammy's asking, Saved up $2,000, which is a lot for a 14 year old. What printer would you recommend? Again, I'm going to say I cannot make that choice for you because I don't know what your specifications and needs are. But if you've got 2000 bucks, you've pretty much got your top pick of any of the desktop printers on the market. You're almost at the point of getting a G Max, they're about 3K, but you could get pretty much anything decent. You can get a Rigibot, you could get like two Wanhaus or three Wanhaus. You can get loads of stuff. So that's a lot of money for a 14 year old. Uh, I don't think you'd have any issues. And yeah, I'm gonna stop answering those questions now. So don't, don't post that. <laughs> uh, 3D print everything, thoughts on SLA printing. Yes, so SLA will give you extremely high detail prints, but it is extremely messy. SLA resins are dangerous to touch. You shouldn't touch them with your hands. They are ultraviolet sensitive because they're cured by ultraviolet. So basically, if you leave them out in the sun, they're going to degrade very quickly. So a SLA printer needs to be a 24-7 use printer. So with the vats they have, if you leave it untouched for like a few weeks, you're going to come back to a solid mass of resin. It would have just gone off no matter what you do. The resins in the bottles last about three months of shelf life. So in terms of good SLAs like the Form 2, which is definitely a very good machine, you need to have it in a space where people are using it all the time. You wouldn't buy one if you're just going to use it now and then. But if you want to print figurines, and I've been asked a couple of times by people wanting to print like, you know, Warhammer style figurines that tall, that's the only way you can do it. You can't do that very well on an FDM printer. The, the detail's just not there. Uh, keep it asking about the up box. Can you resume a print if you open the front door? Yes, you can. 
So the app box has a sensor in the front door, which is really annoying. I disabled it on mine like instantly, but it's for safety reasons. If you open it up, it will pause the print so you, you don't hurt yourself or kids don't hurt themselves. When you close it again, you just press the front closest button. I don't. I think it's the power button. You just press it once. The the cheat sheet it comes with tells you which one does the resume print, but you can just re re um, restart it pretty easily from the printer. Cool. Cool, this is fun. Um, all right, let's go through some more questions. <laughs> so thoughts on oiling filament. A lot of people tend to be committed to this idea of oiling, oiling their filament before it goes into the extruder to stop jams and that sort of thing. Personally, and this is from my experience, I have never done it. But some people say it is like light and day difference between some machines, especially like Bowden style machines if you're getting jams. Some people use stuff like margarine. I would never do that. You want a high temperature oil, which won't burn when you extrude the filament out the hot end. But yeah, some people say it works well. I personally haven't had to do it on any of my machines. But if you're having jams or that, that sort of problem quite often, it's a pretty easy thing to try. Yeah, no, Anthony likes his oiling. He does it on his Wombot. But um, if, you, if you do the little oiler with the, the sponge and the little well and you find it helps, Go ahead. I mean, that's awesome. It's a simple fix. And if it helps your prints, by all means, but I have never had to do it really. Maybe that's because I print in ABS a lot. I'm not sure. A lot of my printers don't really have an issue printing um, or extruding, but yeah, not sure. Hot end in the house. Have you got your new PC yet, dude? <laughs> cool. Yeah. So, so uh, sewing machine oil or machine oil is the machine is the oil that you want. Cool. Um, I'm just going to interrupt here from the questions. So I got a. Da, da, da. I just change it over. There you go. Sweet. So I got this sent through to me from Brandon over on the Patreon, and he's having some issues printing. Uh, he's with, with Simplify 3D, he's having these, these sort of wavy support issues and he's asked me to help me diagnose it. I reckon you guys can probably uh, help as well to help work out what's going on. I, from first impressions, it looks like he's having issues with belts being loose. I don't know how else you get those wavy lines in the support otherwise. But he's getting these, these really obvious artifacting as well when it's changing directions. So I think it's on a Wombot um, and I'm sure if he's not in the, the chat anyway at the moment, he'll be watching this later. Um, but yeah, to me, it looks like loose belts, but it'd be interesting to see what you guys think. Let's change it back over. <laughs> cool. So what else have we got? <laughs> CJ calling out hot end on, on Call of Duty. Uh, maybe I should start a, a gaming channel. Actually, I do have one. I've just never uploaded anything to it. Oh, <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, so, Ricardo, I haven't done any more China's prints since I brought it back. I only did the little Marvin and the test cube. And I printed a, a spool holder as well, but it didn't work very well. Um, so, I'm waiting for the new control board before I can really test the Trinus. But yeah, they've, 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 their campaign's done. They've raised 1.6 million bucks. And they've got a lot of delivery up ahead of them. Um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. I'll tell them to do some circles. So yeah, if it is loose belts, yeah, that's a good point. They'll, they'll look like, um, yeah, look like lemons. <laughs> that's very good. Very good term for it. Yeah. yeah. He was printing at about 70 millimeters per second speed. So he said when it goes slower, it does help. So yeah, maybe it's a speed and a belt problem. Cool. Yeah. See, I, th I thought you guys could help. That's awesome. This is, this is really, really cool. Uh, okay, Jill's aunt asking, is there any reason why we should not expose ABS parts to acetone vapor? Uh, well, it will melt it, which may or may not be what you want. So ABS will, um, will, will melt when it is in contact with acetone. So 
if that's what you want to do, if you want to smooth it by using acetone vapor, by all means, but it means it's not chemically resistant to it. So if you have an ABS part and it's in a chemical environment, it will degrade very quickly if it's in contact with acetone. So it's good for smoothing it. I mean, if you dip ABS in acetone directly, it will just dissolve, which is good for making acetone ABS juice. But if that's not what you want, then don't do it. <laughs> uh, in my experience, also PLA will not be affected by acetone unless it's sort of like not actually PLA or in some cases not actually ABS will not be affected by acetone. It's quite interesting how some plastics by companies are not actually what they say they are. Uh, yeah, don't worry guys, this, this chat will be um, automatically uploaded back to YouTube so you can check it out. <laughs> cool. Uh, and so Duplicat's asking about photogammetry. Yes, I have actually. I did a, um, a scan of my head for a zombie lolly jar that I did at Halloween last year. I've still got the video on the channel. And I use 123D Catch for that. So I just got my phone and just took... I think you're limited 70 photos roughly. So I just took lots of photos around and just stuck them together. They weren't even very good photos. And the 123D, 123D Catch did an amazing job at stitching them together. And it's free, free to use. And then I just took that scan and gave it to some of my uh, special effects friends, Miles and Jules, who turned it into a zombie, which was awesome, using Mesh Mixer. So they, they modeled it into like a zombie head. And then I held it out into a, can a candy bowl. So yeah, uh, photogrammetry is so cool. If you guys haven't tried it, definitely try it. 123D Catch on your phone or your computer, where, whatever. It's free and it's amazing. It's, the, the detail you can get out of it is pretty much phenomenal. And then you can take your scan directly into Mesh Mixer and edit it. Even if you want full color, you can preserve the color, which is so sweet. Lollies. Yeah, we don't say candy. Oh, well, I do some sometimes, but we say lollies. Oh, so you meant the chat. No, yeah, you're, you're right. Sorry, guys. The chat will not be in the stream uh, when I upload it. Sorry. There's no way I can preserve it. <laughs> uh, so is Simplify 3D worth buying? Yes and no. If you're using your printer every day and you're finding that your current slicer is limiting you, like if you're using Cura and you're finding you want to do manual supports, although I haven't tried the new Cura yet myself, um, then yes, it's worth it. If you have a business using a 3D printer, buy it regardless, it will save you time. But if you're not using a printer very often, it's a lot of money to spend on a bit of software. I mean, $150, $140 US or whatever it is now is a lot of cash for a slicer when all the others are free. So I would try stuff like Craftware. And if you really, really, really want the features Simplify 3D gives you, like the ability to have lots of different operations to do different fills of different areas, stuff like that. And the support is amazing. Then, um, then I would buy it. But don't buy it straight away. That's my advice. Definitely try something free to see how you go because you might find 3D printing is not your thing and you might find that it's a waste of money. And I know they do refund people who buy it thinking they can use it on like their up box and stuff like that, which you can't. But if you've been using it for a while, then I don't think you're going to get a refund if you just decide you don't like it. <laughs> cool. Uh, so... What do, you, what do you think about the Micro 3D versus Wanhao Duplicate i3 from OB, IBN CED? Sorry, I can't say your name. Uh, I, you might have missed before, I just slagged out the M3D completely. Um, I don't think the Micro 3D is a very good machine until I have one in front of me printing and I don't think that's ever going to happen. I'm not going to change my opinion on it. So the Wanhao i3 has a bigger print bed. It's got a bigger community and it's got more capabilities because it's got a big heated bed and you can modify it easier. It's not very fragile, whereas the M3D is extremely fragile. So I would definitely go with the Wan Hao i3. It's, it seems to be the machine to go to if you've got a budget and you want to get into 3D printing at the moment. Sweet. Yeah, oh, CJ, you're probably being a bit, bit harsher on Craftware. Craftware is okay. It's definitely got a long way to go. They need to update it. But um, I wouldn't say it's garbage. The ability to do uh, manual supports in a free software is pretty good. And I did two prints off my CraftBot using Craftware and Simplify 3D and there was no noticeable differences in the two prints. Um, so it's not amazing, but it's pretty good. Cool. <laughs> You're hungry. I'm pretty hungry too. This is not helping me very much. 
Sweet. All right. Got time for a few more questions. I'm probably going to cut off at around 1.30 my time, which is in 15 minutes. So, did I ever get the Pango software to work on the Trinus? No, I didn't. I did not get it to work. I didn't try extremely hard, but I couldn't get past the homing issue. And I did save the the P code off it. It's called P code, not G code. But then I couldn't really see it interfacing with the printer. When I put it onto the SD card, I couldn't kick off the print from the Pango software. And I didn't, again, I didn't try very hard. I just went to Repetia and Repetia just worked. Um, but yeah, they're in pre-production. So the software has a long way to go. And again, I think once the homing issue is fixed, it's probably going to be okay. Yeah. And da, 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 what other questions do we have? Uh, Jill, I already answered your question. Have I heard anything more from Olo? Um, no. Are they, you, at the start of the stream, I mentioned that they've just pretty much gone quiet since their campaign finished. And I will dig up something very quickly to show you. So when I talked about Olo last, I think two weeks ago in the stream, someone got in touch and said, hey, Angus, they told me that they sent you one or something like that. Uh, which I thought was a bit strange. So uh, he sent through a screenshot, and I'll just pull it up, of what they said. If I change it to here. So check this out, guys. So this is a screenshot from Olo. Um, and um, he's pretty much saying, you know, he'd, he'd love to help you out with an unbiased review. Um, and they say, we are hoping he will be delighted with his Olo. <laughs> um, I never got an email back from them basically they just went completely quiet and in their campaign they haven't posted anything since their update on the 21st of april saying yeah we got the fund or yeah we got funded so heaps of these guys are kind of wondering where they are what's going on no updates so it's a little bit worrying um but we'll see we'll see what happens there yeah, I, I'm actually possibly going to make my own resin printer because I have some daylight resin now from a anonymous supporter and I might call it the YOLO and actually just try to make it work and that might be fun because <laughs> I've got all the bits I need. So wait, what other questions we got? No, they, they, they have not, Olo has not talked to me at all. <laughs> <laughs> yeah um so test stranger is asking i'd like you to try out some of those cheap delta printers on aliexpress there a few of them look pretty good the cosel mini clones with injection molded parts they look all right i'm not personally going to buy one for myself because i don't have a use for it and that currently that funding needs to go elsewhere into the channel but if i can get hold of one even to borrow i'll definitely talk about it in a review video because they look pretty good. China's come a long way in terms of 3D printing kits. There's still a lot of terrible kits from China that I would never touch with a barge pole, but the new Cosel Mini ones look pretty good. And I think that they're probably a good way to get into 3D printing if you've got like no budget and you're willing to put together a kit which may or may not have good instructions. But as I always tell people, I think 3D printing should be a, uh, either a hobby or a tool. If you want to get good prints all the time, buy an assembled printer. If you want a hobby 3D printing, if you want to get into 3D printing as a hobby, then get a kit because you'll learn heaps, but you're going to be a while before you get reliable prints, if you do. Sweet. <laughs> cool, what else we got? So... Uh, da, da, da. What would... Okay, there's been a few questions about filament making machines and filament extruders. So, uh, Tessa over at Sparky Face 5 has got one um, and I'm definitely going to follow her experience with it. Personally, my experience with the filament extruders is it's extremely difficult to get a consistent diameter out of an extruded filament. The way they do it in manufacturing is they actually pull it at a uniform speed out of a quite a large nozzle to get a uh, a uniform diameter using lasers to measure the measure the, the diameter of the filament like constantly and adjusting to suit. 
So it's very, very difficult to get a consistent like 1.75 millimeters or consistent 2.85 millimeters. So that's my hesitation about filament extruders. I think it's very difficult to make filament that won't jam at some point when you're extruding with it. But if, if I'm proven wrong, which I would love to be, I would definitely look into getting into them because I like the idea of recycling old plastics into new filament. I think that's awesome. At the moment, I just chuck out my wasted rafts and supports because you know, what else am I going to do with them? But if I could recycle them, that would be cool. And I do use some recycled filaments like the filamentive recycled PLA and recycled uh, PET, which I haven't reviewed yet, which I will soon. I'm having a bit of issues printing with it. But uh, in terms of those recycled plastics, they're, I think they're direct from factory. So like when companies sort of stamp off bits of plastic, I think they use that to um, filament to extrude recycled. It's not post-consumer waste, which has contaminants, which is a big issue in terms of reusing plastics. Uh, opinion on the Tevo Tarantula. Um, I've been asked a lot about that one. It looks all right. It's extremely low cost. I'm not going to expect, I wouldn't expect the world out of it for the price, but yeah, it looks pretty decent for the cost. Um, I haven't really looked into it too much though. All right, what else have we got? Yeah, no, you're exactly right, Anthony. You can't, you can't reuse... Because every time you melt plastic, you degrade it. So you can't just chuck all your old prints back in and expect it. You need to use virgin pellets. And I think that's something that a lot of people don't understand. And if you get any contaminants in it, that will... You know, it'll, it might extrude, but you're going to end up having a jam in your nozzle sooner or later. That's the biggest hesitation. And a lot of these kits are done by sort of engineers in their backyards. They're really badly put together. They're very... Like, you get them sent with parts missing this and that, so I, I'm not going to touch them anytime soon. <laughs> Thank you so much, guys, on the 20k. Yes, it's been nuts getting here. And I, I was trying to like um, think of how I could, in my mind, quantify 20,000 people, and I can't. I can't work out like how that's so nuts, 20,000 people. So there is definitely a, a really awesome video coming up to thank all of you for 20,000 because it's been a long time coming and it is super cool. But yes, thank you so much. <laughs> and, and, and a couple more things. Uh, yeah, so just, just again, touching on Trinus again very quickly because I've touched on it a few times. I think they've done a really good job. I think, you know, $1.6 million of funding is ridiculous. They have a lot of fulfillment to do, but I think they'll be fine. I think considering they had a pre-production unit sent to me before that campaign finished, I think they're okay. I think out of all the Kickstarters I've ever seen, they're going to be all right because they actually had a functional prototype and pre-production units. Unlike the Olo, which supposedly has a pre -pro uh, functional prototype and nothing else. <laughs> all right, Crafted, I'll give you a shout out. <laughs> there you go. There's your shout out. And then... Got some other questions I can answer before we finish up. So I was looking through the chat. Again, I don't have my minion. Very sad. She's she's gone back to gone back to Perth for the moment, and my other minion is elsewhere. So I'm doing this all myself. Uh, yes, Sydney Makers Hub, I can give you a shout out and are you actually a Sydney Makers Hub? Because if you are, I'd like to talk to you because I'm trying to get something happening in Sydney. If you mean Sydney is in Australia, Sydney, then definitely give me an, uh, send me a message. <laughs> and I'll say hi to Panareth. <laughs> How can one live without a 3D printer? Um, it's interesting. Okay, well, with... I mean, I know you're not being serious, Anthony, but I will answer it seriously. In terms of having a 3D printer, it's one of those things you don't know what you're missing out on till you have it. So if you don't have a 3D printer, you're, you're sort of satisfied to be like, okay, I broke this. I'll just get another one from the, the shop. 
But with a 3D printer, you start looking at things differently and you're like, well, okay, I have this pair of headphones. I want it to go there. Nothing exists. And it's like currently one o'clock in the morning. I'm going to design and print my own headphones holder. That's how it's changed my life. But coming from an industrial design perspective, that's how I thought anyway. So 3D printing for me was always just a tool and a way to get my ideas out into the real world quickly. But I used to use laser cutting, you know, CNC, and I used to just use my hands, you know, I still do just cut away at stuff, sand, file, buff, polish, drill, till I have something that kind of vaguely resembles what I wanted in the first place. I'm really bad with my hands. I can't draw figurines or anything at all. So 3D printing has saved my, has saved my life because then I can print stuff that's actually what I had envisioned in my head because <laughs> I don't have any hand-eye coordination at all. Um, cool. Hey, Zach, how's it going? Sweet. Um, okay, a few other questions about PETG. Uh, I'm not really the guy to ask about PET very much because I've only used it a few times. But my experience has been with the Colorfab XT, which is a similar copolymer. That's the Amphora blend. And if you're printing with PETG, you don't want the heated bed to be too hot because it has a very low plastic transition temperature, which means if you take it off the bed and the bed's too hot, it'll just flex. So I tend to have my bed at about 50 degrees with built tack, and that tends to work quite well with my experience, but yours may differ. But you definitely don't want it nearly as hot as ABS or anything like that. That's way too hot. Um, you want it quite low because if you take the print off and it's still warm, it could possibly bend because it has that low plastic transition temperature. And the Rigibot 2 uh, review is coming soon. Um, I need to do more testing, but soon, like in two weeks. <laughs> Anthony, you work for Telstra, dude. Just how about you sort it out for us that we have like fiber directly piped to our houses? Because I'm using 4G. Some of you guys may not know, but um, actually this is sort of a nice, nice way to finish up. Uh, this stream is supported by all of my patrons who have allowed me to buy this thing, which is 4G internet. So this is my 4G dongle. And in Australia, 4G is expensive, extremely expensive, but internet speeds are terrible. I get uh, one megabit per second upload speed on my normal connection. This lets me get about 10 or 12 megabit upload speed, which is what I need to do these streams. And it's the only option I have. I, there's, there's no other way to get faster internet where I am. There's no NBN rollout. There's no fiber. The, we have cable and the cable is limited to just over one megabits per second upload. So huge thank you to all of my supporters and patrons who have helped me afford this because it is very expensive and I wouldn't be able to do this any other way. <laughs> uh, I'm going to answer one more question then finish up because I need to go eat something. What have we got? <laughs> okay, so... Alright, laser cutters. Okay, I'm going to touch on laser cutters very quickly. I have used a few different types. I have used everything from the extremely cheap budget uh, Chinese laser cutters that use something called Moshi Draw. If you see a laser cutter that uses Moshi Draw, it's crap. Um, the machine's probably okay, but the software interface is just rubbish. Um, you, Moshi Draw is basically, it's not even vector based, it's like um, bitmap based, and it's just shocking. It's designed for engraving like rubber stamps and things. But what you can do is buy a cheap laser cutter using Moshi Draw and then just gut it. So use the, the platform, the hardware, and then basically put in your own stepper drivers and use EMC if you want, which isn't the best, but it does work. Or you can spend a bit more money on something with that, which has something like laser cut. I mean, they, they change the name of it all the time. Anything that uses a vector-based input, usually they say it's linked to Coral Draw. If it says that, then it's going to be pretty good. And if you have lots of money, then you can use stuff like Versa Laser. Versa Lasers are amazing. Uh, Universal Lasers are amazing, but you're going to spend 10 times as much to get a machine that works out of the box rather than spending time getting it to work from China. So that's my input on lasers. Um, there's a few cool Kickstarter ones coming up. Oh, there was a Kickstarter one. I don't really remember the name of it. Um, there's also the All Forge, which is not a laser cutter. I don't really know what that is. I need to look into it more. But, but the one thing you need to remember with lasers is your, your burning materials. So you need good ventilation and good safety and good fire planning in case something catches fire. Because something will catch fire. 
I'm guaranteeing you'll cut you'll cut paper or something one day and it will catch fire. So that's my in, in, uh, that's my input on laser cutters, and I think we will probably finish up there. I haven't gotten a haircut yet, guys. I am going to get one tomorrow. It's nuts. I need a haircut pretty urgently. Cool. Awesome, guys. Well, thank you so much for joining me. Um, I really, really appreciated it. And I had loads of fun on the, the print that thing, uh, the J-Wall stream earlier. We did like a four-way Q&A. So yeah, if I can figure out how to do that on this channel, I might do it in future. And if you haven't subscribed to Makers Muse already, please do. It does help me a lot. But all of you guys are probably already subscribed because you knew about the stream, which I really appreciate. And yeah, I'll see you guys soon. Have a great weekend. Bye.